a couple of seconds for everyone to join. Oh yeah, I can see lots of people are filing in. Okay, perfect. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining in for this session. So this will just be on medical emergency delivered by Dr. Jeremy Bowman. So just to explain how it works again, for anyone watching on the Zoom call, any questions or comments about what's happening right now, put it in the Zoom chat. If you have any questions that can wait till the end, put it in the Q&A box. And if you're watching on the Facebook, feel free to comment, questions, whatever you want, and Jeremy will get to them when he can. Other than that, I will pass it off to you, Jeremy. Perfect. Hello. I can still see uh, some people are joining, so I'll just give it a little sec. Um, but to introduce myself, I am Jeremy. I am a recent graduate from Brighton and Sussex Medical School. Uh, and I start my first job in Worthing on geriatrics. So if anyone is interested in going there, feel free to message me and talk to me about that. I have designed this uh, kind of aimed at your at the clinical years. Obviously, I think um, this whole, this whole like you're aware of that. Um, but I kind of put it in mind uh, to, to cover the kind of core topics, but also at a general final year level. Um, there'll be some topics which I'll be covering um, which you'll know, you've come across them lots of times, and then I'll pepper just a few things in there that will have a bit more kind of, um, the kind of more niche things that will probably come up in finals, or if they don't, they're, they're, there are topics that commonly come up in finals. Um, so my, my plan for this session was to kind of, yeah, go through the to core topics uh, in a bit more detail. Um, and if you wanted to have a more discussion based topic, we can run something like that in the future. Um, with more kind of cases, but this would be more just kind of laying down uh, the information and kind of from my experience what I found useful. Um, I think we've got around 30 people in. Um, I think I'm just going to start. I don't think. Um, oh, yeah, and there's just a message in there. I think this, uh, sorry, someone just asked on the Zoom chat. I think this is uh, recorded and put on the Facebook afterwards. Um, so yeah, you can catch it up there. And I think these slides will be going out to you as well. Um, so throughout the presentation, there'll be some questions that come up on a poll. Uh, feel free to answer them and then we can get some feedback and kind of answer questions as we go throughout. Uh, additionally, it would be useful if you had some pen and paper just nearby or open a Word document or something like that, uh, because there's going to be questions throughout the presentation that don't work on the poll. Uh, and I think it's really good if you can write down your answer and then you can see if you got it right, because I think if you answer in your head, um, you, you kind of forget what you got right and wrong, whereas if you write it down on a piece of paper, you can kind of see if you've got an answer right or wrong and where to focus your revision later on. Uh, I imagine the people, most of the people here will be third and fourth years. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, that's where I'm pitching it at. Um, and yeah, so we'll get started. So yeah, we'll be covering um, acute coronary syndromes, uh, pulmonary embolisms, pneumonia, and uh, DKA, and a little bit on hypos at the end as well. Hopefully, yeah, this works. Uh, so there's a disclaimer just about uh, this content is created by me. It's not about any kind of curriculum. Um, I haven't actually read through this fully, but um, it's yeah, mainly for educational purposes and you'll get the slides uh, later on. And I've made these slides, so I haven't like, based them off any kind of uh, anything else. Um, and yeah. So learning objectives, we're just going to discuss these key conditions and we're going to go through the uh, history examinations and the investigations that you need to do for these conditions, uh, as well as a kind of basic understanding of how you manage them. I've also got some mnemonics to go through that as well and some OSCE tips uh, and to be able to initiate the initial management of all these things as well. So I said we're doing a bit of cardio, a bit of rest and a bit of endo. Uh, in future sessions I may do more case-based discussion but this is more kind of lecture-based at the moment. So first question, hopefully uh, this will work. I am, uh, so this is the question, I'll read it out and then I'll launch the poll. So a 65 year old man complains of ongoing chest pain for over a year. It is sensual and tight in nature. He has noticed it only occurring while he walks uh, his dog and is therefore finding it increasingly distressing. He reports no dizziness and hasn't faith in when this occurs. He is otherwise fit and well. Which of the following is this gentleman most likely to have? So I'll launch the poll. I think you'll be able to answer it. All right, I think about 75% of you have voted. If you want a bit more time, I'll give you sort of 10 more seconds. Uh, 
All right, we'll end it there. So uh, the correct answer for this one was stable angina. And I can see there's some, some people put, um, I think if I share the results, you'll be able to see them. Um, and yeah, some people put unstable angina. We'll go through a little bit uh, and a little bit about the differences between stable and unstable angina. Um, but it's a reasonable to think that this could be unstable angina. Um, so don't be too decided. And no one put any of the other answers. So that's good. You all, all clearly have some good knowledge. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing that now. Alrighty. Um, so often in OSCEs, you kind of get a follow-up question. If you if you kind of get the first the first bit of the answer, uh, you can't. You, you, they often kind of push you further. So, which single part of this man's history distinguishes this as stable angina rather than aortic stenosis? So, if you could just write down a piece of paper. I don't think I have a poll question for this. So, if you just have a think mentally about what it could be, I'll give you sort of about twenty seconds for that. I can hear some messages coming through as well. So yeah, there are some good answers coming through the chat boxes. Uh, yeah, the key distinguishing feature is no syncope. And this did come up in my finals uh, as to what is the distinguishing factor between the two. And they can often present quite similarly, like chest pain on exertion. Uh, but the key factor is um, no dizziness or syncope. Um, you kind of have to ask those questions in your OSCE as well to make sure you're ruling that out. So obviously it's a different management pathway. Cool. So those are the questions. Let's go through and then talk about this a little bit more. It sounds like you guys know it quite well. So I'm just going to whiz through um, stable angina. Uh, so I think of stable angina and ACS as kind of like a spectrum of diseases. Uh, which are the result of plaques building up, uh, particularly in the coronary arteries, uh, may lead to a, which leads to a narrowing of the blood vessels. Uh, and this results in reduced oxygen to the myocardium, uh, which is most notable when you exercise, and that's where you get the pain. Uh, and then as the disease develops, um, you increase your risk of a rupture of the plaque. And that, when that ruptures, that can cause an occlusion in the artery. And that's what we more go on to think about as the unstable angina, the end, the end stemmies and the stemmies. So stable angina, you need three things to diagnose stable angina. These are three core symptoms of stable angina, or what we would call typical uh, angina, and that is chest pain, precipitated by exercise, and relieved by GTN or by rest. So if you've got those three, you've got stable angina. If you only have two of those things, um, but you have GI discomfort, shortness of breath, or nausea, then we would say it's unstable angina. Uh, and sometimes that can be a question as well. Uh, and obviously, you, when you're taking your histories, you need to ask about relevant risk factors. So you need to ask about classic cardiovascular risk factors, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, et cetera, because those are going to be uh, the things where you can target your uh, therapeutic interventions later on. In terms of your investigations, you need to, uh, everyone needs to have an ECG because you need to kind of rule out, is this stable angina or is this like unstable angina? Are we kind of getting into the uh, like more acute or chronic um, conditions? And then you need to do your bloods. So always say with your bloods why you're doing your bloods. So your full blood count probably for any kind of anemia symptoms. Using these, you're probably going to be giving them some kind of uh, medications. LFTs, because you, you might be giving them statins and you need to have a baseline. You need to review them later on. Thyroid, because they could have like a thyroid storm or a thyroid toxicosis, which could be given chest pain. And glucose as well, because they might be diabetic. So you're kind of checking their diabetic status. Uh, and then you need to, they need to have a coronary angiogram um, and they need to be seen in specialist care if you think it's angina. And here are some pictures of some examples of what it can look like. So hopefully you can see the arteries are getting a little bit narrowed in, in the areas. And then there's like a 3D image as well, which I don't think I've ever used, but I normally use the picture in A. So management, I think, like you say, uh, like it's showing you guys are really good with your management. But um, I always say in an OSCE or an exam that I want to split my management up into lifestyle, disease modifying and non-disease modifying. Um, so your lifestyle is going to be your weight loss, smoking cessation, reduce alcohol consumption. So these are all things you need to mention in your OSCE because it just shows that you're really thinking about the holistic picture of the patient. Uh, disease modifying, so your aspirin and your statins um, as well. Yeah, we'll come up to cardiac biomarkers as well. Um, so that's a question in the, in the chat as well. Um, and there is a bit of confusion about whether you give a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker. I've put some more notes in the, um, in the note section of the slide, but essentially for kind of R level, 
Uh, and when I did my finals, it was certainly monotherapy beta blocker. Make sure they're not on a calcium channel blocker that can interact with that uh, because that can cause heart block. Um, so the things that I normally like, the, I think that the one that you can prescribe is verapamil, whereas, sorry, verapamil can cause the heart block and diltiazem can, I'm just looking at my notes. Um, so that's another thing to think about if they're on uh, any of those medications, but I've put some more in that. Uh, the main thing is just remember is they need to go on a beta blocker and the GTN spray as well. The mnemonic I remember for um, unstable, for stable and dinosaury is GASP. So yeah, your GTN, G, aspirin for A, statin for S, and B for beta blocker. Uh, and importantly there, need follow-up. Um, that's also usually a key point in an exam because uh, it, again, just shows you're thinking about the longer term. Okay, so moving on to something a bit more uh, I don't know, acute and exciting is uh, ACS. So I think of uh, ACS as NSTEMIs and STEMIs. And within NSTEMIs, you can have unstable angina and stable angina. And some people like to split them up differently and just have them as three separate class classifications. But I think they work well by classifying um, unstable angina and NSTEMIs together. Um, so an NSTEMI is anything with uh, unstable angina, sorry, and an NSTEMI is anything with acute chest pain with per, uh, without a persistent ST elevation. That doesn't mean though that you don't have any uh, ECG changes because you can have ST segment depression and you can have T wave inversion, which can show ischemia. And that was always the way I picked up um, if someone was having an end STEMI or, or some kind of uh, myocardial ischemia. And the way I split it up again um, with uh, unstable angina is if you don't have a rise in troponin levels, then let's say unstable angina, Whereas if they do have a rise in troponin levels, then it's an NSTEMI. Um, I can also see a question here about, uh, sorry, someone talking about conservative medical and surgical management. Um, I, I have seen that management as well. So instead of splitting up your answer as uh, lifestyle, disease modifying, non-disease modifying, you split them up into conservative medical and surgical. I think that's another great way of doing it. I think all examiners want to see is that you are structuring your answer. Um, it doesn't really matter what structure you use, just so long as you're not missing anything. Um, so just going back into ACS, um, so we've spoken a little bit about uh, NSTEMIs and STEMIs, sorry, unstable angina and NSTEMIs. So then an ST elevation is where you have um, acute chest pain with ECG, ECG chain, changes that show ST elevation in two leads that are next to each other. So yeah, contiguous leads are, I tried to look at my definition for this, I'm not really too sure because I think they are referring to specific leads, but the way I think about it is in the kind of V1 to V6 leads, if there's two ST elevation segments, then it's a, a STEMI. Whereas if it's in lead one, two or three, it can just be on its own. I think that sometimes leads to some confusion and because I used to look at ECGs and say, oh, was that little bit there raised? Is that, is that a STEMI? I'm not sure. Like, you know, it's only one. And I think my, uh, teachers would always say just try and look for two areas where it's raised uh, and that's usually your market. In your exam it will probably be two or more uh, leads that will have the uh, STEMI so that's what I'd look for. Um, yeah. Features of ACS on history it's the classic you know chest pain radiating up to your uh, jaw or down your left arm. It's got to last more than 15 minutes for you to really have a good going uh, diagnosis. Um, I'll come on to TROP uh, in a little bit as well. I can see, sorry, a question there from Jen. Um, so yeah, just more about the history. You also want to ask about if they have these kind of sympathetic symptoms, so like sweating, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, shortness of breath, palpitations. And I always like to kind of get a feel uh, as their kind of hemodynamic stability, because if they're unstable, then you need to be going your, your A to E management. You, you need to be going to CCU as quick as possible. You need to be getting everyone involved. So I always like to kind of get a kind of, uh, maybe question them about their dizziness, how they're feeling, do they look mottled or pale, things like that. Um, as well, whenever you're taking your histories, you need to ask um, other questions for differential diagnosis, because in NOSCEs, there'll usually be a point for asking kind of screening and other systems. Um, so for chest pain, there are obviously the other cardiac things, which we'll talk about. We'll talk about pericarditis later. For respiratory, your PEs are gonna be kind of more kind of pleuritic chest pain, aren't they? Your pneumothoraces are going to be more kind of one-sided. Again, pleuritic and pneumonia is going to have more kind of uh, infective signs. Aortic dissections are usually going to radiate to your back and they're going to be like this tearing sensation. And in my experience, they're much, much more painful. And we're talking about aortic stenosis as well. 
GI. Uh, I think GI can be a bit difficult to uh, distinguish on a history. Um, so we've certainly had cases in our simulations where someone's had uh, like sharp chest pain uh, and it sounds very much like it's ACS, but then the examiner, you know, they've done an ECG and it's normal and then they, we give them their um, PPI and then their chest pain gets better. So um, I would always like make sure you include that in, into your uh, differential diagnosis, unless it's like barn door, there are lots of chest pain, they've got huge ECG changes. Uh, and as well, another differential LSK pain. Investigations, uh, so I can see some questions coming in about that already, um, but I split them up again. I always have this, I always like to show the examiner that I know what I'm thinking about and I'm structuring my answer. So I always say, I'm gonna split them up into bedside, bloods and imaging as my investigations. So your bedside, you're gonna do your news and your obs because that can give you some really good information and you're gonna do your ECG there. Uh, make sure you mention it there. And then you do your bloods. So we've had a question about cardiac enzymes. I'm not going to speak too much about cardiac enzymes, but you are going to do your TROPS and you're going to do them as soon as you can and then you need to do them later on. Um, I've put some more information about when the levels rise and when and when it's important. You need to do them at six hours or at 12 hours or at 24 hours. And troponins can stay raised for 14 days. So sometimes they can be a mis bit misleading if they've had an MI back, you know, seven days ago. So sometimes it can be a bit infusion, uh, confusing and sometimes we use different cardiac markers as well. Um, so if you get the slides, have a look through that. I've put all the information I had in my notes there. As well, as well you're going to do the other bloods we've spoken about. And again, they're going to have their coronary uh, angiography. Uh, now in Brighton, we did coronary angios and uh, in the PCI suites. So they often got their PCI right there and then if, if it was needed. I imagine other centres will have, have, that, have it like that as well. Um, that's just kind of another kind of nuance to consider if they're going to have to have their coronio and then be moved again to a PCI suite. So moving on now to having a look at ECGs. Um, we've spoken about some of the ECG changes. I want you all to just spend 30 seconds just having a look at this ECG and writing down somewhere in a Word document on a piece of paper or you can write in the chat um, what you think is going on. Um, yeah, write down perhaps where you think the uh, where the problem is and if you can identify the problem. Okay, so I can see some uh, suggestions coming through. Hopefully, um, you guys have had a chance to write down your answer somewhere as well, if you haven't written in the chat before. Um, so this is meant to be widespread T wave inversion. And some people have put STEMI, uh, which as well, it could be. There are some areas which I think are suggestive of STEMI, um, but importantly, um, and with STEMIs, you can get T wave inversion, but I don't think there's enough ST elevation segments for this to be a full blown STEMI. So just for those people who weren't able to see I'm just going to circle some of the T-wave inversions, which show evidence of uh, ischemia. Some people as well put um, where the areas of the heart are and where it would be. For me, we can see a little bit in V4, a little bit in V5, a little bit in V6, a little bit in V1. So this is certainly your lateral leads um, that have been affected. There's a little bit going on in, in V2 as well, and we can see that going throughout. Um, so perhaps potentially there as well, and in ADL. I can't really see too much in the anterior leads. Um, there is perhaps a little bit of a slurred upstroke here, which is maybe why some people are thinking this could be an ST elevation. But an ST elevation needs to be by more than one box. And I don't think this is particularly too elevated. Perhaps here, there is some suggestion it could be, um, but I just don't think it's big enough. And I think this is the problem I had um, when I was a medical student, was that sometimes it looks like it can be an ST elevation, but I think for exams, it's usually going to be like tombstone. It's usually a bit more barn door in my exams, at least. Uh, sorry, I'm just reading through uh, some of the questions now. Does P-wave inversion in AVR mean anything? Um, so AVR is an interesting lead. Um, often, I think of AVR as being the negative lead. So often things in there can be flipped. 
So this T wave being positive in AVR is actually a bit misleading because there's actually a T wave inversion, in my opinion, uh, for AVR. And so when you look at AVR leads, you'll often find they're flipped and that doesn't really mean, if you, you often will see T wave inversion in AVR and it doesn't normally mean ischemia. Um, the P wave inversion here, I'm not too sure about. Uh, it's just like an isolated um, example of it, so I'm not too sure. Yeah, some, uh, Hannah has put isolated T wave inversion in AVR is, is not too important, yeah. Um, on silver and tumor version, are there sometimes leads in which are not invert? Yeah, yeah, there are, like AVR and V1. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. No stupid questions here. Uh, how big do Q waves have to be in V1 to V3 to be significant? Um, I don't actually have the, num uh, the number of boxes in the back of my mind ready. I just think of it as big. Um, but if you wanted more on that, I can go through some ECGs in another session. Um, I think for your exams, just keep it simple. Just T wave and uh, just uh, ST elevation. No one's expecting you to be cardiologists. Um, they're not going to expect these kind of nuances coming from you. Just bond or ST elevation or T wave inversion or T wave flattening are, are kind of what was good enough for my finals. And certainly um, when we had uh, some of the consultants coming and talking to us, they never gave us ECGs. Even the cardiology consultants never gave us things that were uh, kind of quite, quite hard to see. They're normally much, much bigger. Okay. So moving on uh, to the next ECG, um, just have a little look at it and again, write down what you think could be going on. All right, hopefully you've had enough time to have a look. I can see one person's written in the chat box as well, ST depression. And certainly I agree, this does look like ST depression here. The way, the way I uh, think about ST depression and ST elevation is if you draw a line from where you can see um, just the QRS complex, that usually gives you a hint if there's ST elevation or ST depression. Uh, so AVR, we're kind of ignoring because it's a bit of a funny lead, but certainly in lead one, there's a bit of depression. Well, I've drawn that going up. But certainly in one, it looks a little bit depressed. Certainly in V4 and V5 and V6, there's some uh, ST depression going on. Perhaps maybe in V3, you might be able to convince yourself. Uh, this this kind of looks all right. This kind of looks all right as well. And again, we've, we've kind of already said V2 as well and V3. So that's normally just the way I, I do it to kind of help show to myself uh, what's going on. I kind of draw an imaginary line and we can see, yeah, um, we'll come on later to talk about the areas, but yeah, certainly in the lateral leads and perhaps a little bit um, in the anterior leads as well. Sorry, these two weren't there. Um, yeah, lateral leads and the inferior leads. All right, just another quick ECG for you to look at. Um, I wanted to give you guys just kind of lots of examples because um, I always found ECGs and chest X-rays really difficult to um, to interpret. So hopefully. Now you see an ST depression, you'll recognize that this is an anterior ST depression, particularly here, this looks quite bad. And it's in two leads. So again, as we said, that kind of rule of two to keep in the back of your mind. Um, that there's some kind of ischemia going on. Okay, so we've had a look at some ECGs. Some, uh, these would all be n stemmies, wouldn't they? Because none of them are kind of have their ST segment uh, that's raised. So. Um, Let's go on to how, how we manage them. So we always do an A2E uh, management. It's always going to be the correct answer. Uh, and mention glucose as well, because we said about diabetics, but also because people who have uh, poor glucose control uh, usually have bad outcomes um, in cardiology wards. And so we always, we always try to check their glucose. Uh, we give them the aspirin and we give them their other antiplatelet. For us, it was uh, clopidogrel, but for you, it might be, might be uh, tigregrel. I can never say that word, um, but it's kind of trust dependent. You give them your nitrates and you give them the morphine. Moving on to somewhere I think is a bit confusing. I think if you just want to keep it simple, just say n stemmies, give them fundopyrex. That's kind of your 
that won't be wrong. It's not technically right, but it, it, it's good enough. What you are meant to do is you're meant to calculate someone's six month mortality score, which is their GRACE score. And if their six month mortality is high, then you're meant to coronary angiogram them in 96 hours. And if they're not going to get that angio in 96 hours, or if they're not going to get it within 24 hours, then you give them fundopyronex, and then they can have the angio once the fundopyronex is worn off. It's a little bit confusing. I did learn this for my finals. It didn't actually come up. Um, they just kind of stuck to the simpler principle, which I said, like fundopyronex for NSTEMI. Um, but yeah, that's probably what a cardiologist would be doing. They'd be doing this GRACE score. And they often give them these other things like glycoprotein 2 and 3 receptor antagonists. Um, I kept seeing uh, this thing called tyrofiban being prescribed. Um, is that clear? Would you like me to go over that? All good. Cool. Let's move on. All right. So have a look at uh, have a look at this ECG. I can see someone just said so. If the grace score is low, if the grace score is low. Um, then you just give them fundopyronex if the grace score is low because you're not going to be having their angios. So you just treat them as if they are not going to be going for their PCI and in that, that intervention. That intervention. So, as we said, they're not going to be having the angio in 24 hours. And again, if they're not uh, high risk of bleeding, then they're appropriate to give them fundopyronex. And I don't know any more about that. I don't know if you switch on to warfarin later on or how long they have that war. I'm afraid. I just that was just all I, all I learned. Um, okay, moving on uh, to this ECG, so have a look. I think you guys are pretty good at ECGs. Yeah, so I can see someone has put uh, anterolateral uh, STEMI. I certainly agree this is anterior. This is certainly very obvious in the anterior leads. There is a question about lateral leads having a, a little bit of ST segment rates. I can't see, perhaps in lead one, you might be able to say, certainly. But yeah, I would go with much more of what Matt has said is that this looks like straight away you can see the ST elevation in leads one, uh, V1 to V4. Where is there some in lead one and lead six, I think I would leave that to someone who's got a much better eye. So as an F1, I'd be happy to say this looks like a, like a V1 to V4 STEMI. I don't think I'd be confident going any further. I'd let a cardiologist go with that. Um, and probably this person is going to go for their PCI, so they're going to get all that information later on. But in, in my exams, this was certainly what I got in finals. Uh, Q waves. Um, so there's obviously the QRS complexes. Um, so I'm not sure what you mean by Q waves, because um, often they denote to specific things. Um, I always thought that Q waves would be more kind of this thing. Does it, do you, um, it, it, was there something specifically relating to Q waves that you had a question about or like thinking about something about with Q waves? Uh, Pathological Q waves. Oh, sorry, I see now, I see. Um, I never got pathological Q waves in my finals, so I never learned more about them, I'm afraid, um, because we were told just stick to MIs and NSTEMIs. And if it's something that's coming up in your curriculum, I'd, I'd read into it, but it seems to me like quite, um, it, like, I don't know, it might be important. I haven't uh, learned more, I'm afraid. And I don't want to give you misinformation. Oh, if you're talking about left bundle branch block, uh, yes, we will be talking about that. And we will be talking about S1, Q3, T3s later. Um, all right. So moving on now to the heart zones. It sounds like you guys are pretty good clued up on your heart zones. Um, but these are, the, these are the kind of three main heart zones, and they donate to the different areas of the heart. Uh, so as we said, the anterior area, the lateral area, and the inferior area. The way I remember which R3 they supply, sometimes that comes up in exams. Um, the way I think about it is the, the anterior area looks like an upside down L. So that must be the left anterior descending. So I always put my phone 
like if you if you forget, you can put your phone up to the up to the air and it forms like an upside down L uh, to like form a mirror. Um, so yeah, that's how I know that one. Lateral is the circumflex because it wraps around the ECG, uh, and that's just the way I remember that. Um, it's kind of like towards the edge, so yeah, it wraps around. And then the right coronary artery, I haven't really got a uh, good way of remembering the right coronary artery. I just remember it's the kind of other artery uh, that's on the ECG and it's in the inferior area. Hopefully that's useful for someone. I right, have a look at this ECG again uh, and let me know where you think what's going on. If you're not going to write in the chat bar, I would encourage you to write something down like in a Word document or again on a piece of paper as it just kind of helps you to force yourself to answer the questions. Yes, I can see some answers coming through. Certainly I would agree this is a, a, an anterior lateral semi. So we've got uh, ST elevation in two or more leads and we've got them in the anterior leads, haven't we? Uh, going up to be four and we've got them in the lateral leads that circle round uh, certainly here as well you could go on and say perhaps AVL um, perhaps a bit of lead two um, there's certainly some T, uh, some ST depression in uh, lead three uh, and AVF um, but yeah I think for an exam anterior lateral then is fine uh, and then yes someone there has noted the reciprocal changes uh, and that's sometimes a way to see how it's affecting uh, the other the other territories. Um, I think people like to say reciprocal changes. Again, it never came up in my exams, um, but yeah, good 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 to know. So reciprocal changes for everyone who doesn't know is that if you get a massive MI in one area of the heart, you often get ECG changes in the other area as it tries to compensate or it shows uh, ischemia as well. Um, so that's what that's what those reciprocal changes are in in lead uh, three there. So because this area. And the anterior lateral area is so bad, you're getting changes now in the other areas. Cool. Have a look at this ECG, let me know what you think. It's a bit all over the place. Perfect, yeah, I can see Gaia and, and Matt, absolutely. Uh, and also, yeah, some reciprocal changes as well. Um, so for those of you who haven't see, seen, definitely the lateral areas, we've got um, so, some ST elevation here. So this looks, this section here looks quite raised, doesn't it? Going on, kind of tombstoning around. Um, not so much in need one, but I think over here, I think I'm, I'm happy to say this is elevated. When you compare it to kind of the baseline of the ECG, this certainly looks raised, doesn't it? Um, and definitely in, in uh, lead three and kind of uh, lead, lead two as well. This, this does kind of look, this segment here looks raised and it? it's, it's well above the, the natural line of the ECG. So it's certainly like a raised area. So I'm happy to say this is infralateral. And then someone has mentioned the reciprocal changes again. Again, if, if you want to look like a boss in the exam, um, there's definitely some ST depression going on here. So we've got some ischemia going on in the, um, anterior section of the heart as well or through the left coronary artery as well yes they are uh, oh yes there are some t-wave inversions going on here as well i'd say that looks fairly inverted um, it's sort of going fat isn't it um, and this section looks quite flattened as well so i'm quite happy to say it's a little bit flattened but when you compare it to kind of uh, avr AV, yeah avr um, they certainly look inverted and, and some of them look a little bit flattened for lateral semi Going on to STEMI management. And hopefully all of you are aware, um, you manage it using this acronym called MONA, um, which means morphine, oxygen, nitrates, uh, and aspirin, uh, plus your clopidogrel, or whatever your other uh, antifailer is. And, but I always think about it as do your A to E approach and then do your morphine. There is some controversy about oxygen. I'm not really gonna talk about that, but basically if you're an F1, putting oxygen on the patient isn't a bad idea. No one's going to blame you for putting oxygen on, on, on a patient if they're unwell. Um, so I think that's fine. I think there is some nuances and some cardiologists would say don't worry but that's really kind of specialist stuff. 
uh, and they need to get their thrombolysis as soon as possible. They need to go to their PCI as soon as possible. Um, and yeah, so I, I remember, uh, I actually don't use Mona. I use something called Monarch, which is basically Mona, uh, M-O-N-A, and then R-C for the ARC. So the R is for relocate to CCU. Again, that's a, kind of another exam thing that kind of extends your knowledge that, you know, you know, that, you know, the basic management is Mona, but then, you know, they need to go to CCU, which is really important as that, that is the, one of the main things that prevents deaths. It's the same with strokes, isn't it? You get them to the stroke ward as quick as possible to prevent deaths, get them to CCU as quick as possible. And the C in Monarch is just meant to uh, represent clipper de Grasse, so I don't forget. Uh, we've, we got to only give O2 if the O2 stats are dropping. If the O2 is normal, don't give them O2. Yes, I agree. I absolutely agree. Sorry if I was unclear. Only give them O2 if, if the, it looks like they need oxygen. Don't just whack it on if they're at 99 stats. I, sorry, I fully agree. Um, so yeah, moving on to the long-term management. Um, again, I split up into lifestyle disease modifying and non-disease modifying. So it's very, very similar to your... Um, uh, and STEMI, and also very similar to your um, uh, stable angina. So it's just your kind of exercise, dietary advice, beta blockers, your antiplatelets, your aspirin plus your other antiplatelet, your statin and your ACE inhibitors. Um, so there's a question coming through, would I check when do you give oxygen when SATs are uh, less than 94, less than 90? So for the hospitals I've worked at, we always look between 94 and 98, and that's considered fine. In, a, in someone who doesn't have COPD. Um, so if they're less than 94, that's when I'd be worrying that perhaps I want to give them some oxygen. Also, if they're breathless, I'd be considering oxygen as well. Um, yeah. There's a question coming through as well. Someone saying, um, what did GASP stand for? So that was your GTN, aspirin, statin, and beta blocker. Um, so the only addition here for the long-term management of um, STEMI is that you give them the ACE inhibitors, as that's shown to have good outcomes. Um, and hopefully, if you say all these things, your examiner's face will do something a little bit like this, uh, as mine did. <laughs> Perfect. So, moving on to some more ECGs. Uh, have a look. Have a look through this. Uh, let me know what you think. Uh, Ellen asks, "Do you give both aspirin and clopidogrel?" In Brighton, we do, yeah. Um, but in London, it might be Ty Craigrelaw. Um, or one of the newer generation antiplatelets. This is specifically for STEMI, yeah. Cool, yeah, I'm seeing some answers come through. Um, I absolutely agree. This is uh, an end. I would say if you've got the history that suits it, um, it would probably be good enough to say end STEMI. But if you don't have the history, then it's fine to say T wave inversion in leads uh, V1 to V4. And some people talk about septal, and some people just say anterior. I just stick to anterior. But yeah, if you haven't uh, spotted it, cool. Um, then we would say, yeah, if you, you can see this T wave here is going down. This T wave here is going down, isn't it? This T wave is going down. This T wave is going out, and then we go back up to V5, and that's kind of going up again, isn't it? These ones will kind of look a bit, uh, these, these look all right. AVL looks inverted as well, but it's just kind of one on its own, so I wouldn't get too, um, I wouldn't get too distracted as well. Is there a bundle branch block? Is a good question. This does look a bit funny, doesn't it? It could be a capture beat. Um, yeah, and this does look quite, quite, quite deep, doesn't it? Um, I don't think this would be good enough to say bundle branch block, but you know, it's good that you're thinking about kind of next steps as well. We'll come on to left bundle branch block in a little bit. So have a look at this.
Yeah, I would, I would certainly agree. Anterior lateral STEMI. Uh, I've lost my marker. Yeah, just in kind of uh, these ones. Don't know. They're definitely teams, but I got something like this in my exam where it was just kind of like far and door. And then we just spoke about the management. Um, someone said Wolf Parkinson White. My understanding for Wolf Parkinson White is if you think about your P wave and then your QRS complex. My understanding for Wolf Parkinson White is it looks a bit kind of like this. As in, you kind of have this uptake or uh, kind of merging because you kind of have that re-entry pathway. Um, I'm not going to be talking about any more than that, but just the kind of general shape I got used to was sort of like no P wave, and then it kind of started a P wave, and then it kind of slurred up. Um, but yeah, it didn't come up in mind, but it always comes up in textbooks, doesn't it, and kind of practice exams. Uh, yeah. Finally, last ECG, I promise. But I think it's good to go through as many as you can. Okay, so I can see some people thinking uh, left bundle branch block. Someone else uh, said AF. Um, I would certainly agree. This is an irregular rhythm, isn't it? It's sort of like we've got nothing, got quite a long space between these two, aren't they? Uh, and I would agree that this is a left bundle branch block. Um, and I think my, I start thinking bundle branch blocks when the whole ECG just looks a bit wrong, like, what's this like I've, it just doesn't that doesn't look like a normal cure you know i'm so used to seeing this aren't i it, it's that just doesn't look like like that anything's going on so i start to, that's my trigger to thinking is this uh left bundle branch block um or right bundle branch block um and the things with uh uh, or, uh left bundle branch block and right bundle branch block um is that if it is left bundle branch block you have to treat it as new ischemia and so interp uh, Interpreting things like um, ST elevation or T wave inversion, anything like that just goes completely out the window. If you've got left bundle branch block, you just can't interpret it. You just have to say, this is left bundle branch block. They need to go uh, for PCI as soon as possible. You, you treat it, in my opinion, like a, like a, like a STEMI because um, it could well be. The heart is just kind of confused. It's a bit, uh, the electroactivity is just not coordinated uh, as it would normally be. And so that's where you get these really weird uh, complexes. So you just can't interpret it. So someone asked, where's the marrow? And I do think I've tried to find the best ECG I can for William Marrow. Uh, as some of you are aware, that left bundle branch block, uh, you get this kind of, uh, the way you remember it is through William Marrow. And this is meant to be, um, so, there are more there is more to it than that but i think just for again finals uh, and just for like where you're at is the the you just look at v1 and v6 is the easiest way to think about it. just look at v1 and v6 whenever you're looking at bundle branch block like i said there is more to it i'm not going to go into it more than that um but this is meant to represent a slight w you really have to look close and it might not project so well under over um powerpoint and then the marrow is meant to be kind of this this M going up here. Um, we didn't get it in our exams. I think it's quite hard to spot. Um, the classic is that it's meant to look like this. Um, so hopefully you can see the W in the marrow here. Again, it didn't come up in ours, but it's important to know about. You might see it as an F1. Cool. So that was kind of the, the, the bulk of uh, what I was going to talk, uh, talk about it. Um, and now I'm going to kind of speed up as we kind of spend a lot of time on ECGs and that's kind of what I want to focus on is something I struggle with um, but just moving on to now so some quick fire stuff so pericarditis uh, is, is a kind of another differential for chest pain uh, the kind of differentiating factor between pericarditis and um, ACS is that they have uh, their chest pain gets worse whenever they lie flat or when they take a, a breath in and they often you see them sitting forward in this the, if you have an actor um, they will usually kind of sit forward and clench their chest um, in, in, in your oskies. Uh, and they kind of have these other kind of malaise symptoms, kind of like uh, non-productive cough or a bit of kind of flu-like symptoms. Uh, when you listen to them or when you examine them, you can sometimes hear a pericardial rub, 
And if you've ever, uh, if you've ever heard a pericardial rub, yeah, I don't know, many, some of you may have it. It does kind of sound like something is rubbing uh, kind of against the, the chest wall. Is the best way I can describe it, kind of like a rubbery sound, uh, something kind of rubbing. Uh, and then they can often be a bit breathless and they will have a tachycardia as well. Um, just a kind of quick breakdown. Uh, so it can be infective causes, inflammatory causes, and idiopathic causes. And then there's this weird kind of post-MI uh, pericarditis as well. So you know, infective are your viruses. Um, Coxsackie is the one to remember. Inflammatory, I just remember rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Uh, again, just stick to easy things because there's a lot to learn. Um, and um, there's this weird thing where you can get pericarditis following an MI. So if it's within the first 20, uh, 48 hours, it's just called like a post MI, um, it's just called a post MI pericarditis. But if it's two to six weeks later, we call it this Dresler's syndrome. It comes up in um, MCQs quite a lot. And uh, it's this kind of weird autoimmune reaction that happens. You get a raised DSR and you basically just treat it by giving NSAIDs. Pericarditis is a bit of a, a, bit of a weird one. Um, in terms of kind of treatment, but you, you're generally just given supportive management and a bit of pain relief. NSAID seem to work quite well in my experience. Um, so the thing to look for, um, I know I said we've done a lot of ECG, but I remember we've got a few more to look at, um, is uh, you look for this global widespread um, kind of uh, saddle shaped ST segment. And that can sometimes be confusing if you're thinking is this a STEMI or pericarditis, um, but it's like a kind of saddle. And that's, that's kind of what you're taught as a medical student, but the, the best marker for pericarditis is this PR depression. And I will have some examples um, to show you uh, what that PR, and it can be quite subtle, but it will be in a lot of the leads. So if you spot it once, you need to spot it more than once to kind of prove to yourself that it's pericarditis. Um, and then if, they, if you think they have pericarditis, then they need to have a transthoracic, transthoracic echo. I'm not going to ask you to look too much at this because I think we are running out of time. But um, you can see here they've got this saddle shaped ST segment. It's meant to be in majority of the leads, if not all of the leads. So yeah, it's meant to be a kind of saddle. Um, it's kind of more pronounced in lead one. And when you kind of look at it, you can kind of just generally see there's a lot of saddles going on. This one is quite hard to see, I think. There's no saddle going on here. But Hopefully, if I zoom in, you'll be able to convince yourself that there's some PR depression going on. So if you look at the P wave here, it is going down ever so slightly. And again, in this one, it's going down. And again, in this one, it's going down. You can kind of just see it, maybe not in V1 actually, but you can kind of see it in a lot of the leads, this kind of dip in the PR. It's kind of all going down. I think, you know, just seeing it in one lead is not enough to say it. But when you start seeing it everywhere, you start seeing, oh, is this pericarditis? Uh, lead three is not very good, is it? Uh, they go B6, B5, you can kind of all see them sloping down. And so that's your, that is your best mark of a pericarditis. Um, and again, this is meant to show a bit of some saddles going on. Um, so hopefully you would recognize, oh, there's a bit of saddle here, but is it pericarditis where it's not all over the place? But then hopefully that'll trigger you to just look at these P waves that are kind of just tailing off. This P wave's going down. This P wave's kind of, sort of going down I suppose this one is this segment here is depressed isn't it normally it's quite flat but they all kind of depress a little bit if you draw the line here above it I can't draw it when I'm zoomed in but if you draw the line above it it is just below it by about a box so it's quite quite difficult to spot but hopefully you wouldn't get this in an exam you'd get it in the context of a history and it'd be which is the most likely um, and hopefully you'll be able to recognize this pericarditis management NSAIDs as I've said uh, Colchicine is a, is a fine end said, but you, you can use something uh, weaker if you want to use ibuprofen or something. But yeah, I think we normally said Colchicine in our exams. All right, moving on now to some respiratory stuff. So I'm going to launch a poll, um, have a quick read of the question. 65-year-old woman comes in with sudden onset shortness of breath uh, and chest pain on inspiration. You suspect she might have a PE, she's otherwise fit and well, which investigation is most likely to be diagnostic. Uh, this will be available to watch on Facebook later. Uh, 
Right, I think most people have voted uh, have, so I'm just going to end and share results. Um, so yeah, the main, the, the diagnostic investigation, which is a key thing you need to read in your MCQ, the diagnostic investigation is a CT, uh, CT Andrew, CT PA is, the, is what we shorten it to. Um, and this is just an angiogram of contrast that goes through the pulmonary tree and you can, you can see where the clot will be. You do need to do a chest X-ray. You do need to do a 12 VCG. A high resolution CT scan may be appropriate in some cases, but the most diagnostic in someone who's got nothing, nothing else going on, because we said she's otherwise fitting well, CT pulmonary, uh, CTPA is the diagnostic investigation. Right, PEs, what are they? They are thrombosis that launch off, or they're emboli, sorry, that go into the um, pulmonary tree. And they get stuck there and they cause uh, a problem and they cause you to become breathless because that area can't function anymore without its blood supply. There are other causes of emboli. There's a fat, air, and amniotic fluid. These are the ones I learned, but they never came up in any MCQ I ever did. And I did all the past med ones. I did all the uh, BMA ones as well. It just, you know, it's, it's pretty much a thrombosis every time. I'm not gonna, I don't think I have time to talk about it here, but it's important to know that DVTs can nearly always cause PEs, but they don't cause strokes and they don't cause peripheral artery disease either. If you think about the um, if you think about the venous system, if you've got a vein in your leg that goes up, it's going the vein is going to expand, isn't it, as it goes up towards your heart into the vena cava, and it will go through your heart and then out into the pulmonary tree, and then the art the veins will now narrow. So if we just say this is the heart, the veins will then narrow again in the pulmonary tree, won't they? So there's no way for a clot in the venous system to get into the arterial system and cause a stroke. So if you're in an exam and someone asks you what's the causes of a stroke, don't say DVT because it, it, you, the only way it would be able to give you a stroke is if they had a hole in their heart or some kind of congenital heart disease where the clot can pass through the, the, the heart and into the arterial system. That's the only thing I wanted to point out and that I did get asked by consultants. Moving on, typical features in a PE, shortness of breath, chest pain, um, and sometimes they cough up a bit of blood as well. Um, and they're often tachycardic. That's the main feature on the ECG, not this S1, Q3, T3 stuff. The main thing you'll see on ECG is a tachycardia. And then in your OSCEs, you need to ask about risk factors. You need to ask them about recent surgery. You need to ask them if they've had a period of immobility. These are where your marks will come in. Pregnancy is another risk factor, cancer is another risk factor. Uh, and then the kind of modifiable risk factors are things like smoking, COPD, or sorry, not COPD, but smoking, obviously, uh, and if they're on the pill. Um, and this kind of helps you, um, oh, someone's mentioned anticoagulation as well. Yes, you would need to ask that in your drug history. Um, and this helps you understand if the, if the PE was provoked or if it's unprovoked, because then their management needs to be slightly different. So going into a PE workup, Obviously, you're going to take a full history, you're going to examine them, uh, and you have to perform a chest x-ray. Again, this came up in my finals. Um, we had a summer with the PE, and the, pretty much the only question we got asked for the PE patient was, what is the first investigation you're going to do? Uh, after you've done kind of your bloods and things, it was like, what's your first imaging investigation? And the correct answer was chest x-ray, not CTPA. They have to have a chest x-ray before they have the CTPA. So it's really clear because you have to rule out other causes for their breathlessness, which could be like pneumonia in like little Doris who's 88. So I've made this little algorithm on the following page, but essentially you do the chest X-ray and then you do a well score. And if the well score is greater than four, so that is 4.1 and above, then um, you give them the CTPA. If it is four or less, then you do uh, a D-dimer. And if it's positive, then you do the CTPA. If it's negative, um, then you pursue other likely diagnosis. Because if you remember your D-dimer test, if it's negative, it's really, really, really unlikely it's going to be a PE. But if it's positive, it could be a bit up in the air, can't it? So this is the algorithm I followed. Um, so you, you think there might be a PE, so you do a well score. If it's greater than four, PE is likely, so you give them a CTPA. If the CTPA machine's not available to the middle of the night, uh, give them some interim anticoagulation, which is not treatment dose for PE. It's like the, it covers them. It's sort of like the prophylactic dose. And then once you can confirm it, then you switch them to the treatment dose. <clears throat> if 
if the well score is low, then you do, 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 do dimer and then you do a, P, a CTPA if it's positive or don't do anything if it's negative. I know I'm repeating myself, but hopefully just to help it go in. Um, so yeah, your management, obviously we're going to do A to E, give them oxygen if they're breathless or low sats. Um, worry when they're not maintaining BP, that's just a general rule of thumb. If their BP is bad, then uh, yeah, yeah, that would be, uh, that, that's the thing to worry about. I can see someone's uh, asked a question as well, I'll come back to that. Um, you want to get your IV access, these kind of things that you obviously want to do. And then you give them low molecular weight heparin. It's a rough set of uh, tinzapyrin or anoxapyrin. Um, you can give them uh, fundopyrinx as well. Uh, but you have to make sure you diagnose the PE before you start giving the treatment doses. If you suspect uh, that it's a massive PE, and don't ask me what the definition of a ma massive PE is, um, or they have renal impairment, I think a massive PE would be like, you know, cardiac instability, they're probably starting to lose consciousness, dropping the GCS, or their BP is dropping a lot. Um, then uh, you would use unfractionated heparin instead. Someone's asked uh, about a, v a VQ scan. A VQ scan is used instead of a CTPA. Uh, so it's used um, often for people who can't have a CTPA. So that's often people who have renal impairment, because the contrast is re uh, nephrotoxic. Uh, and so if it's ne nephrotoxic, you don't want to give them um, the contrast, so then you do the VQ scan. I think as well, you sometimes do a VQ scan if they're pregnant, depending on the stage of pregnancy, and if the contrast is seen as uh, teratotoxic. Um, yeah, we're well, coming on to the management of PE. So you give them their par on day one, you know, within 20, you know, diagnose the PE. Now they need to go on warfarin within 24 hours. It's Cause you remember warfarin, you have to titrate up there. It takes you three days for it to kind of really kick in. So it needs to be covered on something while you're titrating up the warfarin. Nice also says you can use one of the, uh, the NOAX and the only one I could find was rivaroxaban. I've not seen that used in my hospital, but it might be used in one of yours. Um, and yeah, they have that for three months and they need to have a follow-up appointment. In your OSCEs, you need to say, I'm going to follow this patient up in a respiratory clinic um, or with a specialist because they need to have a follow-up. And, and, and the reason for that is whether they need to stay on the treatment anymore. Remember, if it's an unprovoked PE, then they need to be on it for six months. If it's provoked PE and they've got no other risk factors, nothing else, then they can just have three months of treatment. Uh, assuming that at the review, their treatment is kind of result or that yeah it seems to be a result uh, another thing as well um at, uh, we have in brighton they're just quite like uh holistic in the way they did their oskies so you always have to mention things like oh we'd give them a, an information booklet oh we're going to give them an alert card because you know that tells other people they've had a pe and if they ever fall unconscious um oh yeah just little things to add on i didn't know these existed i've never seen them used in real life but good thing to say in oskies all right moving on to the next question now so 65 year old male presents with a productive cough and shortness of breath uh, and a fever for the last four days. Examination of the chest reveals crackles in the right lung base. You suspect pneumonia and calculate a CURB 65 score as three. Which of the following is the most likely organism? Have a little think, I'll give you sort of 20 more seconds. Target INR, uh, to answer Omar's question, is yeah, between uh, two and three. Uh, greater than like three to four is for people who have like metallic heart valves who have AF. Um, that's the only other one I'd remember it for. Cool. Uh, so good job, everyone. Uh, really good knowledge. I assume the other people perhaps haven't, haven't covered microbiology so much. Um, but the ones to remember is the most likely organism for pneumonia in someone who's otherwise kind of fit and well, got nothing else wrong with them. If this question isn't asked, isn't kind of throwing any other curveballs at you, um, then yeah, go with strep, strep pneumo. Um, staph aureus, they're going to be sick as a dog. They are going to be so unwell if they've got staph aureus. And it's going to be really obvious they're unwell. And there's going to have to be a reason for it. Like, it has to kind of get it. It normally follows influenza infection. So in your question stem, it will be like, so-and-so has had flu recently now they've developed like chest symptoms of like pneumonia what's most likely like that would be a staph aureus klebsiella will come onto a microplasma and lesionella will come onto a little bit that asks um oh staph aureus as well most likely ivdu correct as well uh, that would normally be in the stem 
Um, Matt asks, uh, in an OSCE setting, do they need to know how many weeks or month follow up they need following up? I learned it, yes, because it, it was a follow up question. It's some things, it's good to know the follow up. Certainly, uh, asthma, they like they liked to know. In my OSCE, I got asked, you know, what would I be doing? And it was on the marks um, to say that um, you would follow them up uh, for asthma. So I imagine um, for PEs as well. If, if you've got a full PE station, um, then I would probably mention it. If it's like an A to E assessment, I probably wouldn't mention it. Okay. Just to let you guys know, it is two o'clock. I'm definitely overrunning. I'm going quite slowly for my content that I have. I thought it was just better to go through it in a bit more detail and answer questions. Um, we are on slide 52 of 81, um, but that's mostly because the next couple of slides are mainly just going to be lots of pneumonia chest x-rays, so you can get an example of what they will look like. Um, if, you, if you want to go, feel free to leave, otherwise uh, I'm going to keep teaching. It's probably going to be about another 30 minutes, um, depending on how things go. Right, so classification of pneumonia. So I think there are two main um, classifications. Um, so I'm just going to get rid of this poll. Okay, uh, there are two main classifications, and these classifications are used to help strategize like how which antibiotics you're going to give and how you're going to make your diagnosis. So the first uh, kind of category is it is it community acquired, is it hospital acquired, or is it aspiration pneumonia? Now your community acquired, they're going to develop the pneumonia within. Uh, five days or less of an admission. So at day five, if they've got the pneumonia, it's a bit it's a bit kind of up in the air what they could have, but if it's day four, three, two, or one, then you would say it's community. Some guidelines say if it's between day three and day five, then consider a hospital acquired pneumonia. Um, that's absolutely fine. That's that, uh, those are those guidelines. But certainly if it's three days or less, then you would go, this is a community acquired pneumonia. It's likely gonna be kind of more typical bugs. If it's hospital acquired pneumonia, if, it's, if, they've, if they've been in hospital for five days, it's classified as hospital acquired. That day three to five is just a bit woolly. Um, and hopefully in your exams, they'd be really mean to give you a day four pneumonia. Aspiration pneumonia are uh, fairly, uh, they, you would see it in the stem of the question, like they have stroke or they've been unconscious for a while or every, you know, you, they would have a reason for aspirating, wouldn't they? The other way you diagnose pneumonias is in typicals and atypicals. And your typical pneumonias are those that we kind of all associate with. So they have the productive cough, um, they have shortness of breath, they have malaise, they have infective signs, they have fevers, they're breathless, or they're, they've got a raised um, heart rate. And it's acute. They look unwell. It's pneumonia. You know, we know what pneumonia looks like. And th that's caused by typical bugs. Yeah. So make sure you go through your history and ask about, you know, have you been feeling unwell, any headaches, have you been coughing up anything, any sputum, have you, you know, had a sore throat? Um, kind of just make sure you ask all your kind of common symptoms. Importantly as well, whenever you're taking a pneumonia history, ask if they've been abroad, ask if they've been in contact with any animals, and always ask their occupation. I haven't mentioned it yet, but whenever I take a history, I always start my history by confirming the patient's name, their date of birth, and their occupation. Because in my OSCE, someone's occupation was they're a shipbuilder. And as soon as they said that, I went, you know, what's going on here? It's very rare. Shipbuilder is very specific, isn't it? And it turned out they had interstitial lung disease of which their exposure to that was due to shipbuilding. So it can immediately give you the, 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 the way in if they, if they say something that's a bit off. Um, so I always, always, always ask uh, their occupation at the start because it can just give you a hint. Moving on now, sorry, to the atypical bugs. Um, they are your more chronic pneumonias. They don't really make sense. They're like pneumonia, but you're not really, you know, the symptoms aren't really fitting to well together. So they often have a dry cough. They, they might be coughing up a bit of blood. Um, and they have these kind of extra pulmonary symptoms. Like, what does that mean? What, you know, basically anything else that can go wrong with them, they've got something else going on. So they've got a weirdly low sodium or they've got a weird rash and they've got this dry cough, like things like that that start thinking, like, what is going on here? And the, the kind of tip I got was that they often look better than they are. The other way to define atypicals is that they don't have signs or symptoms of low bar pneumonia. So when you chest x-ray them, if it's just in one lobe, it's likely going to be a typical. But if it's kind of bilateral or if it's kind of all over the place or just the whole lungs filled out or have got cavitating lesions, that's atypical. And obviously the antibiotics used for typicals are um, different. I've made you guys this slide to summarize all the bugs that I learned for finals. This is my final slide. It served me well. Um, questions did come up. And this is kind of the bare bones you need to know for each of the bugs. I'll go through the, each of them for you. 
uh, there's no point putting it up there if I'm not going to talk through it. So um, strep pneumonia we've spoken about, most common, low bar pneumonia, they're going to be sick, we'll talk about that. Haemophilus influenza, it's a gram negative role if they ever give you that. Um, and it's common in COPD patients. You're going to notice in the stem it says pips.copd. That kind of swings you towards that. Pseudomonas. Now, pseudomonas is a not very virulent bug. It's quite hard. It, it doesn't grow very well. So therefore, in order for it to grow well, it needs a way in and it needs a way your body has to not be able to resist it. And so those are your ITU patients. Those are your immunocompromised. Those are your cancer patients. Those are, they need a way in. That's what I think about it. They're not always sick, very sick because of it, like with staph, but they, like I said, they are previously immunocompromised and now they've got this pneumonia and, and that can kind of push everything over the edge. And they have staphs, as, as, as I've said, they're with your IBD users or they're following influenza infections and they are really, really, really sick. They're septic, their heart rate's off the charts, their blood pressure's way down in their boots. They're not, they're not looking good. Their fever's crazy um, and yeah. Moving on to the atypicals, Klebsiella, I think about in alcoholics and diabetics. So if that's in the stem, just kind of flag it up in your head. This is perhaps Klebsiella. Uh, and they form these cavitating lesions. They look a little bit like um, a TB. I can't actually tell the difference between a TB and a Klebsiella, but it, for me, it's the history that gives it away. And sometimes they cough up this red jelly sputum. Legionella is a common one. Everyone remembers this as the, the pneumonia that's uh, classically seen in someone who's been to Spain and they had some dodgy air conditioning or they dodgy kind of water supply and they've got Legionella. In my experience, and the microbiologist at Brighton told me that that's, you know, classically in an exam question, but they were devious and they didn't give us any of that stuff. They gave us what, what they see normally, which is 50 year old men who are alcoholics. They tend to get um, Legionella, Legionella pneumonia, apparently. Um, and they often get this weird low sodium, so hyponatremia, and they often get a lymphopenia, so they get a high lymphocyte count, whereas normally with pneumonia, you'd expect a neutropenia. So that's the kind of telltale sign that this is a lesion. And in our exam, they gave us a, um, a set of bloods and their uh, lymph, uh, lymphocytes were way up and their neutrophils were normal and then their sodium was way low. So it's kind of like, OK, this is, this is a lesion. Pneumocystis uh, gerovici or uh, gerovici. I've never known how to say that, um, but that's your HIV associated with HIV. Um, a bug presents with dry cough. The classic is that they get exercise induced desaturations and they don't have chest signs. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. Um, mycoplasma pneumonia uh, is your other, as another final, another atypical. They get dry cough, atypical chest signs, so kind of bilateral involvement. And they, the kind of giveaway thing for this one is that they can get kind of this autoimmune hemolytic uh, anemia. So that's just kind of a weird thing if you see that. Um, Kind of on the bloods, uh, or if they say they've got a rash, that's the other kind of giveaway for mycoplasma. Hopefully, you know, I don't expect everyone to take this all in. Um, and this is just here for you to, to go over in the future, and, and then it's all there. So, uh, lymphopenia uh, reduced lymphocytes. I'm so sorry if I've got them mixed up. I'm just going to double check now for you on Google. Uh, that's a bit embarrassing. Yes, I'm very, very sorry. I've got myself mixed up. Uh, lymphopenia is reduced lymphocytes. Uh, thank you, R, for pointing that out. Whoops. Um, yeah. Hopefully, you remember that it's uh, reduced lymphocytes. All right. Moving on now to, to low bar pneumonias. So these are all low bar pneumonias and these are just a good way for you to practice looking through all the different lobes and what all, all the different signs can be. Uh, and they're typically your elderly patients and they typically have kind of underlying diseases. Um, I'm sure we've seen some pneumonia patients by now. This, is a, this, is, this slide is here to represent and show to you the kind of anatomy of the lungs. Um, obviously we've all done anatomy, but sometimes it can be a bit uh, confusing to try and understand the lobes. So I put this in here to just kind of help you uh, when you look through the slides in the future as to where the different things are. And the key thing I want to talk to you uh, today about was something called the silhouette sign. And this is something that really helped me identify where the bug is. Because it's always the exam question, isn't it? Where is the bug? Someone always asks it, where's the bug? In which lobe is the bug? Because they're quite happy for you to say it's in the right lower zone, um, but that doesn't really say if it's in the right lower lobe or the, or the right middle lobe. So in order to, to understand which lobe is what, we use something called the silhouette sign which is where you look at another border 
And if the border is obliterated, which is the radiological word for it, which means that the border is kind of fuzzy, you can't see it very well, then we say that, that um, the bug is likely to be sitting on top of that area. And this applies when you're looking to see if a bug is in the right middle lobe or the right lower lobe or in the left upper lobe or the left lower lobe. So if the bug is uh, sitting on top of the heart, uh, we can see here from the side view, if we're looking at the right lobe here, if it's sitting on top of the heart, it will obliterate the right heart border. So it will completely shadow all of this and you'll see it on some x-rays later on. Um, right middle lobe obliterates the heart border. So if you can see that the border is shadowed, the bug is in the right middle lobe. Same is true for the left upper lobe. So if the bug is in the left lung, so you're seeing some kind of fuzziness here, and you're seeing the left heart border is obliterated, then it's in the left upper lobe. And you can see here that the left, uh, the bug would sit here on top of the heart, and that's why it obliterates the border. Hopefully you'll see that uh, coming up in a little bit. Um, the other thing to say as well is always look to see whether where the bug goes and where the increased density goes, because if it goes higher up, uh, then it's going to be in the right uh, upper lobe rather than the right lower lobe. Whereas if you can see the fissure and the bug and the kind of consolidations going down, then it's more likely to be in the kind of lower lobes. All right, have a look through some pneumonias now. Quickly just think through where's the bug. Um, if you can write it down, that'd be great. All right, so these are taken from Radiopedia. Uh, I don't know if you guys have used the website before. And their reason for saying that this was a right upper lobe, and I agree with them, is that you get this fissure going on here. So the lobe is kind of completely, the, like, the, the, this lobe is now completely taken on with the uh, pneumonia. Someone has said it could be the right middle lobe. Uh, if we go back to kind of this diagram here, let me just clear all the, uh, if it's in the right middle lobe, which is this orange section, we'd see the fissure going down. We'd see all that kind of consolidation going further down. In the uh, but at the moment, we just have a nice straight line, didn't we, going across the fissure? So that that defines it as being kind of stuck in the right upper lobe. Have a look at this uh, X-ray. Let me know where you think it could be. Yes, I agree, left, left lower, and some, someone's put uh, lingua. So if you thought this could be the left upper, because it could be over that area, we can see here, we can draw a nice line over that left heart border. So the heart border is not obliterated. It's in this left, uh, like lower section. Uh, the previous text area was showing right upper lobe consolidation. Um, so this one is showing uh, uh, left lower lobe consolidation here. Um, remember that if you say consolidation in your exam, consolidation is saying that this is pneumonia. So, so I normally say there is increased density in that area because you're not sure. If you're just being showing an x-ray, you can't say for certain if it's pneumonia unless you've got the history. Um, whereas if you're saying, uh, sorry, yeah, if you're, so if you're saying consolidation, then you are saying this is categorically pneumonia. Um, whereas if you just say increased density, you're kind of covering yourself by saying, I can recognize that area is a bit kind of more white, but I'm not sh confident to say it's pneumonia at this point. Uh, yeah, it's in that one. Have a look at this one, let me know what you think. Uh, AP, I'm not sure what the sale sign is, I've not heard of it before. Okay, so Ellen, have a look at this uh, chest x ray and let me know whether you think um, which lobe you think it's in. Uh, and everyone as well. Mm. 
Mm, okay. So I can see some mixed answers. Remember the left low, the left side doesn't have a different low. So it's just left upper and left lower. I don't, I don't usually refer to the lingula. I know it can be infected, but I know it's quite a small area. And this is, this is quite a wide spread, isn't it? This, this area of opacity in this is quite a big section of the lung. And so I think the lingula is, is quite, quite small normally. Now this is meant to be left upper and the significance of knowing the heart border and the silhouette sign uh, is, is apparent here. Some of you might think you can draw the heart border sign here. It looks like it's going along here, but I think what's really going on is a bit of a trick of the a trick of the eye is that what you're seeing is the bronchi going down and that's giving the illusion of the heart border. Yes, there is something here. I agree that you can see the heart. There is, you know, we can roughly say it's in this area, but the border is not as nice as it was on this slide. Let me just remove all the ink. This was a very clearly defined border here. So we can say that the pneumonia is behind the heart there. So therefore it's got to be in the left lower lobe. Whereas here, it looks like the consolidation is on top of the heart because we've lost that nicely defined heart border. So this is a left upper lobe pneumonia. In reality, if you're unsure, you can get a lateral view of the, of the, of the lungs uh, and that can definitively show you which lobe it's in. And I would probably advise most of the time you will do that. In, in, in the exams and in MCQs, they tend to give you these kind of uh, quick fire uh, questions as to which lobe it could be in. Um, so yeah, we can see this heart border here isn't, you know, you can't really distinguish the side, the, a, a clear line between these two areas. So that's why we say the heart border there is obliterated. Hopefully, uh, Eleanor, that's helpful. Um, we're gonna go through a few more examples as well to hopefully uh, get it in. Okay, so have a look at this one. Let me know um, what lobe you think the pneumonia is in. Okay, so this is meant to be right middle low consolidation and again it's coming back to that silhouette sign that i was speaking about earlier you might so again we can say quite confidently there's something going on in this area so first of all we know it's going to be in the right middle or the right lower yeah but as we said earlier with the with the heart silhouette sign we can't really draw a nice clean line for the heart border we can on this side reasonably well it's not, not that great but reasonably well this side we've lost that heart border I'll get rid of the markings again so you can have a look at it. We've lost that nice, clearly defined heart border. So then we can say that the pneumonia is sitting on top of the heart there when the x-rays have gone through. And the only lobe that sits through there is the middle lobe of the lung. All the way back, you can have a look here. If you're looking at the lung sideways, that is the part that sits on top of the heart, the middle lobe. And that's why we get the loss of the heart, um, the lobe side. Sorry, the loss of the heart border. And that this is the left side. And that's where we get loss on the left side when it's in the upper lobe. So this one, you have got a lateral view for this one. So have a look at it. Let me know what you think. Okay, you can see a mix of answers coming through. This is meant to be a left lower lobe pneumonia. Now, this one, I agree that it's a bit tenuous to say whether that's a clear line. And so whatever the doctor looking at this has done, they've got a lateral view of the lungs. And if we divide our lungs up, this is the upper low, uh, lobe and this is the lower lobe on the left side, we can see that the, mo the pneumonia is down here. And so this has to be a left lower lobe pneumonia. It could be the upper if you just had this one, but with the with the other X-ray, it looks a lot uh, more defined, doesn't it? You can clearly see the pneumonia down there. So that's why we see the left lower. Uh, again, all these slides will be up on mine for you to look through later. Have a look at this one, let me know what you think.
<laughs> good stuff, good stuff. This is the uh, right lower low. Um, I, I think you might you might think this is the uh, the silhouette sign, um, but I think for this one we can say that is a nice clean border on the heart. I can, I think I'm quite happy to say I can draw around it. I think uh, someone on this one may have done a lateral view um, and because they're a bit unsure. So yeah, you could say this is right middle of and I, I agree. It wouldn't be, um, you wouldn't, it's more likely that it's in the uh, right lower low, but you can't definitively say it is. So someone's done a, a lateral view and the pneumonia is meant to be back here. So if I draw in the heart, uh, the lobes for you, you kind of have the, uh, the kind of upper here and then the, the lower kind of, kind of extends up, doesn't it? Uh, and the middle is meant to be kind of here, isn't it? So th those are the kind of the lobes. And so the heart, this area here is meant to have the uh, pneumonia. Hopefully, hopefully that's useful and hopefully it'll help you in your exams. Um, this is just, uh, so does anyone have any questions about that? I know I've gone through quite quickly. Um, okay, if you do have any questions, feel free to type them. If you want to ask questions at the end, put them in the Q&A section um, and I'll, I'll get to them at the end. Uh, so Numisista Jarevici chest x-ray, I, I can't pronounce it. Um, but this is just, you can see the difference in the pneumonia. This is an atypical pneumonia. You can see the whole chest away. It looks a little bit like, um, um, what's it called? Um, oh, I'll just go out of my head. Um, not the effusion, the pulmonary edema. It looks a bit like pulmonary edema. Um, you know, it's just kind of widespread. Oh, miliary TB as well. It could equally, yeah, I agree. It does look a little bit like uh, miliary TB. It's kind of everywhere, isn't it? And you need the history to put it, put it together. And if they had HIV in the question, you would know this is uh, HIV, TB, HIV pneumonia. So yeah, workup, as we said, full blood count. I've put, um, uh, I've put the kind of descriptions here. That's meant to be a low neutrophil count. Um, using these, you're gonna be checking for um, dehydration. I agree uh, with Fizzo, it looks a bit like ARDS as well. Um, so you, uh, you're, Using these, you're going to be doing because you want to get that U for the uh, curb 65 score, and you also uh, can, and you also might want to check their sodium. Looking for Legionella, uh, and we also check their CRP. And sometimes we say in, in Brighton, we used to say if the CRP was over 100, just give them antibiotics. It's not very. I don't know if it's good medical practice, um, but I have seen it on some guidelines that if you suspect 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 pneumonia and the CRP is over 100, it's good enough to give uh, broad spectrum antibiotics uh, while you wait for the chest X-ray. <clears throat> Um, you can do arterial blood gases if they're sat low and you want to see if it's uh, desaturating and my exercise and things like that. Um, but it also can be used for if they've got, if you suspect they might have some kind of underlying condition as well. Uh, and you want to say, well, do they have COPD? Well, this could be more likely to be haemophilus influenza, couldn't it? Um, do you do chest x-ray, obviously. And as well, you need to do cultures and you need to do your blood and you need to do sputum cultures. Don't forget that you need to do both of those. Uh, I need to send them off for MCNS. So don't say in your exam, oh, I'm going to do blood and sputum cultures. You're going to say, I'm going to take blood and sputum cultures and I'm going to send them off for MCNS. So I'm going to see what bug it is, if it grows well, and what antibiotics it's sensitive to. You need all three of those. You can't just say, I'm going to do cultures. You need to kind of specifically say that you're going to do MCNS on them. Curve 65 score. I think hopefully you're aware of this. I put it in here in case you're not. Um, basically, it's a scoring system. Um, know the ranges. I did learn the ranges for my exams um, as in uh, just, just kind of like quick at your fingertips. Um, and yeah, if it's zero, probably one at home. If they're one, consider the admission. So everyone over 65, you're going to consider for admitting. Uh, and two or more, that's the, that's a get them in, get them in. Because these things, these numbers are really hard to reach. Like a, a respiratory rate of over 30 to get your point, you got to be really unwell to get that. New confusion, you got to be really unwell. You're really over eight, you've got to be really unwell to get that. So yeah, if they're, if they're scoring two, you've got to get them in. Management. Now, I think the management for pneumonia is difficult because it's, it's there's obviously a lot of different antibiotics and there's obviously, obviously national guidelines and there's obviously local guidelines. For exams, they tend to examine you on national guidelines. And certainly for the PSA, that, that was how things went. 
Um, <clears throat> this is quite a complicated slide and it goes through the, the kind of reasoning for these things. But I have summarized that into a nice table for you to learn um, for your exams. So basically, if they've got a low, severe cap and NICE does not have any scoring systems to determine the severity, they just say it's up to clinical judgment. So if you don't think they're that unwell and it's a community acquired pneumonia, amoxicillin works fine initially because you assure it's most likely going to be strep pneumo and strep pneumo responds well to amoxicillin. You can give them a macrolide or tetracycline um, if you're not sure. Sorry, if they have, if they have a pen, uh, allergy. And if you want examples of each of these, I put that in the notes section as well. So a tetracycline would be your doxycycline. Uh, a macrolide would be something like clorithromycin, erythromycin. If it's severe, then you give them coamoxifab, which is a bit more stronger than amoxicillin, and you give them the macrolide, clorithromycin. Moving on to hospital climate ammonias, if it's low severe, again, up to clinical judgment, then you give them coamoxiclav. Um, and, and if you suspect that it's a severe hospital acquired uh, pneumonia, um, then you give them uh, pipe, bacillin with tazobactam. Now, I always just remember that as tazacin. Uh, we used to call it vitamin T on the wards. Just give them a bit of vitamin T, you know, that'll get them better. Um, it's probably not the most uh, professional way of calling it, but uh, it's just because it used to be given out so much. Um, and that's kind of roughly what I remember for the main is they're kind of like just three things. Um, Freya, in case they didn't answer your question, severity, NICE doesn't have a scoring system for severity, and so it's up to clinical judgment. There is no kind of way to say this is a severe or this is a normal or low severe pneumonia. They just say it's up to you. So if they're, I, I would go on their blood pressure, I would go on their heart rate, I would go on how unwell they feel. Um, I go on if they're sweating, I would go on kind of all these things, what their CRP is, um, yeah, what their kind of ranges are for their, for their, uh, and, oh, and also if they're septic. All right. Moving on to the last section of this talk. Cool. Let's have a reading of the question. This came up in my exam. I'll wait to about uh, a bit more of you have answered. I don't know, around, around 20 people have answered. I'll, I'll leave it up for a little bit longer. I'll give you 10 more seconds. All right, I'll stop it there. Okay, so majority of people said give them some uh, 100 mils of not benign saline over the next hour. Some people went for uh, insulin and some people went for uh, a bit of saline with some potassium in it as well. This I think is a confusing question, uh, and so I'm going to go through it. Go through it all. Um, the correct answer is what the majority of people have said. So you give them just fluids, because the question is asking what the most immediate treatment is. So you have to imagine you're in the A to E scenario, and what's the first thing you're going to give them? And the first thing in the scenario is fluids. Now I got this question wrong uh, when I did it in my mocks. <clears throat> because I gave them insulin, I thought, you know, they've got DKA. What's the truth of DKA? It's it's uh, insulin. And I, you know, you know, we can, you know, if you're going to give one thing, give the thing that, that that saves them. But the correct answer is is uh, fluids, and that's reflected in guidelines as well. So the first thing you're going to give them is fluids. You know, while you're giving them fluids, you're going to get a nurse there to go do the insulin, get set up the insulin. So you know, you are going to get give probably the insulin at the same time. But for the, the exam purposes, this is more just about exam technique. First thing you're going to give them is uh, fluids. So just just a few more slides. There's only, there's only a couple more, only about five more slides. Um, so DKA, what is it? It is they have to have diabetes. They have to have evidence of ketones, either on blood or urine or on the blood. Uh, I don't think you can get it on a gas actually. I don't know why I put that there, but some gas machines might do it. Uh, I think actually the ones in Chichester could read um, the ketones because they're really good gas machines, and they have to have evidence of acidosis. 
Yeah. So notice there, there is no mention of their glucose level. Okay. So for a DKA, you can have a glucose level of 10. You can have a glucose level of five, but you can still be in DKA, DKA if you uh, fit those criteria. In reality, you're never really going to get someone with a glucose of five who's got DKA, but it's just an important point to recognize that in, uh, in OSCE, they might ask that. And you don't you never talk about the glucose, it's just the presence of ketones. The features. So they often have abdominal pain. They often are really thirsty. They're often really, really dehydrated, which is why we give them fluids. They might have evidence of this Kussmaul breathing. So for anyone who hasn't seen that, that's kind of deep, fast breaths. So if you've ever gone for a run, that's the kind of breathing you do. It's the kind of as opposed to the PE patient, which, which is going to be a much, much more kind of faster, rapid breathing, a bit more kind of like much more, uh, much more rapid. All right. <clears throat> Someone asked uh, about, can you get it in type two diabetes? I'll come on to that as well. Uh, they have this like sweet smelling breath. Um, if you haven't smelled it, it's very distinctive. I'm sure you've heard this before. It smells very sweet. It smells sickly to me. It's, it's kind of just this very sweet smelling breath and they often vomit as well, uh, making their dehydration worse. Uh, and in your OSCEs, you need to find a precipitating factor. So in my simulation, they asked me, I had someone with DKA and the main marks were for finding out that she had been staying with her mum and had forgot her insulin and would have a chaotic lifestyle, only been taking like a few of her insulin um, a day um, or missing doses and so she developed DKA. So that was really important to talk about that and counsel her about that. There can often be like a counseling station. Investigations, um, kind of the similar ones we've already said. They need a 12 ECG because you, um, their potassium can get messed up. So you need to monitor them for their heart issues. Obviously you need to look at their glucose um, to see, see what's going on that. Urine dip to see um, um, evidence of ketones. Um, the glucose is more just to see uh, how, um, how much they're, to see that they are diabetic really. It kind of helps you confirm, but again, you don't need it to diagnose them. The, you know, you do standard bloods, again, glucose in there, you do gas to look for the acidosis, and then you do other tests to look for precipitating causes. So things like chest x-rays, you might do cardiac enzymes for MRIs, and yeah, there's a chest x-ray at the moment. Initial management, you're going to do through A, A to E, and you're going to put them on the ECG. If, uh, if they have, um, yeah, if you think they've got DKA, they need to have an ECG, they need to have cardiac monitoring, they need to go to ward when they've got cardiac monitoring. Going to catheterize them because they're really dehydrated and you need to check that fluid output. You need to have the fluid balance chart going on as well. And something I, I didn't really realize till fifth year, they are glucose is really pro-thrombotic. So you they do die from um, thrombotic events. Uh, so you need to give them TED stockings or, or you need to give them prophylactic doses or whatever your uh, anti-thrombotics are. Um, and yeah, you said fluids. And someone has, written, Harry's written that uh, dehydration will kill them both. Yes, that is the main thing. Uh, and because they have these huge shifts of fluid balance, what can also kill them is cerebral edema, confusingly. So we correct their fluids, but we also don't want to correct them too fast because they can get cerebral edema. So I'm moving on now to this slide, which kind of summarizes DKA treatment. And you can see we give them lots of fluids, but there is a little sub note at the bottom um, which says that if they're young, you might want to just slow that down a little bit because cerebral edema is another killer. Um, but, so in my uh, exam, they asked us to prescribe uh, fluids and you had to prescribe this first one and you had to prescribe the second one as well. So the, it's with the second liter, that's when you add the potassium chloride. And the reason you have potassium is because uh, insulin draws out potassium from the cells. Uh, sorry, puts potassium out of the serum into the cells. So you give them potassium to keep it going around their body. Um, and yeah, so you're going to check their uh, potassium regularly. Um, and then the definitive treatment is you're going to give them insulin and you're going to give them so much insulin. You're going to keep pumping them full of insulin that you may have to give them glucose so that you can give them more insulin so that you may want to have to give them glucose so they don't have a hypo. So you give them 0.1 units per kilogram per hour and you only stop giving them uh, insulin once their ketosis has a role. Not when their glucose returns to normal. You, you stop giving them insulin only once their ketones have resolved. And yeah, as I've said, you give them so much. If their glucose levels are coming down, you give them more glucose so that you can give them more insulin. And you continue their long-acting insulin as well on top of that. So you're giving them a lot of insulin. Um, they need to go to HDU. You need to monitor their fluids, as I've said. They need to have hourly bloods um, for at least the first 24 hours to check the potassium. And we use a blood gas monitor for that. And you need to have a diabetic nurse come along. 
um, as well for the full office, as we said, full office of the extra marks. Complications, I've written these here for you to learn for your exams, but the main one I think about is the thromboembolisms because they're really prothrombotic and the acute kidney injuries because they're so dehydrated they can die from it. Hypos, just a really quick uh, final note on hypos. Just remember for your exams, four is the floor. Four is the floor, it rhymes, really uh, easy thing. If you look at a, a glucose level and it's, and it's less than four, four is the floor, so they're probably having a hypo. Common, common OSCE scenario, A to E, is got an unconscious patient, you need to check their um, glucose status. Their symptoms can mimic a bit like an MI, so a bit of nausea. Uh, can also mimic a, a lot of things, really, can't it? Uh, dizziness, sweating. And the thing um, that kind of distinguishes them is that they look drunk. So often nurses will say, we, we had simulation in our um, OSCEs and they said, you know, a nurse would say, oh, this stupid, you know, annoying drunk patient, we just found them on the steroid, you know, what are they doing? It's so annoying we have to treat these people. She was being really kind of antagonistic. And then when you went through your A to E, you'd find that she, the person was diabetic and they had like a really low uh, glucose. They'd taken a, a kind of overdose of insulin or something. Uh, and yeah, they're unconscious. Ooh. Uh, these are kind of three ways I think about it, how you give glucose, and this comes up in the PSA. So if you're in the community, you give them glucagon. Uh, if their GCS is not reduced, you can just give them some food. And if they've got a low GCS, then you give them uh, 100 to 150 mils of 10% glucose. And then you need to repeat the BM in 10 minutes. Um, and then uh, if it's still low, then you repeat the above. And if it's come up a bit, then you can give, give them some carbohydrates. Like that. Right. That, that is it. For me that is all everything i have to say some takeaway messages um, i think we've, we've gone through them in enough detail i'm not going to keep going longer there's some more useful links here uh, if you want to look through the guidelines for pneumonia and the antibiotic treatments especially with covid uh these have now changed um i put the latest ones on my slides uh, but this might be a useful link to look at as well uh, and yeah if you want to give me some feedback uh, this would be great you can scan it or go to the link um, uh, yeah, that's everything I had to say. If in the future you like my teaching and want me to teach again, I would probably, uh, I'd be happy to teach more kind of discussion based. So more kind of like go through individual cases and go through my OSCEs cases. And you can just talk through kind of what I had to do and I'll just give you a scenario. And it'll be much more kind of question and answer based teaching rather than this lecture style. Uh, so put that on the feedback uh, and then they, and then they can do that. Look perfect. Thank you very much for being so interactive. It's been good. I think the host of whatever whatever is uh, will end it once once it's ready. I'm just waiting on you guys to do some feedback, um, but feel free to leave as well. If you have any questions as well, feel free to put them in. I can I can answer anything that has been quite long, so I understand if you want to go.